day, good afternoon, good morning. Welcome to another episode of Wandering Wednesdays with Mrs. Walker. As you can tell, I'm not at school. I am at home. I've had to get a little creative this week with our edition of Wandering Wednesdays as I am trapped at home just like all of you because of the weather outside. And when I left school last Thursday, I had no idea we'd still be out of school all the way through Wednesday. So I'm here at my house. In a little bit, you may see my dog Bailey come through. Sometimes she comes in and gets in my lap. She's really too big to be in my lap, but she tries anyway. Now, by special request of one of our fifth graders, they wanted me to read one of Carl Hansen's books. So I picked Flush. So I'm going to read you the first chapter of Flush. You can get this book as an ebook. Check it out from our public library. Or, of course, you can come by our library at school and check it out as a book there. Um, you could also get it um, through Kindle um, and Amazon if you want your very own copy. But here is the first chapter, chapter one of Flush by Carl Sa Hazen. The deputy told me to empty my pockets. Two quarters, a penny, a stick of gum, and a roll of grip tape for my skateboard. It was pitiful. Go inside, he said. He's waiting for you. My dad was sitting alone at a bare metal table. He looked pretty good, all things considered. He wasn't even handcuffed. Happy Father's Day, I said. He stood up and gave me a hug. Thanks, Noah, he said. In the room, there was another deputy, a bored, jolly bear standing next to the door that led to the jail cells. I guess his job was to make sure I wasn't smuggling in a hacksaw so my father could break out. It's good they let you keep your own clothes, I said to Dad. I figured they'd make you put on one of those dorky uniforms. I'm sure they will, uh, will sooner or later, he shrugged. You doing okay? How come you won't let Mom bail you out, I asked. Because it's important for me to be right here. Important how? She says you'll lose your job if you stay locked up. She's probably right, my dad admitted. He'd been driving a taxi for the past year and a half. Before that, he was a fishing guide, a good one too, until the Coast Guard took away his license. He said, Noah, it's not like I robbed a bank or something. I know that, Dad. Did you see what I did? Not yet. He gave me a wink. It's impressive. Yeah, I bet. He was in a surprisingly good mood. I'd never been to a jail before, and honestly, it wasn't much of a jail. Two holding cells, my dad told me. The main county lockup was miles away in Key West. Mom wants to know if he, she should call a lawyer, I said. I suppose. The same one from last time, she wasn't sure. Yeah, he was all right, my dad said. His clothes were rumpled and he looked tired. But he said the food was decent and the poli police were treating him fine. Dad, what if you just say you're sorry and offered to pay for what you did? But... I'm not sorry for what I did, Noah. The only thing I'm sorry about is you have to see me locked up like an axe murderer. There were other times my dad had gotten into trouble. They wouldn't let me come to the jail because I was too young. I'm not a common criminal, my dad reached across and put his hand on my arm. I know right from wrong, good from bad. Sometimes I just get carried away. Nobody thinks you're a criminal. Dusty Mullman sure does. Well, that's... Because you sank his boat. If you just pay to get it fixed, then maybe. That's a 73 foot foot hooder, Dad cut in. Do you know what you're going to do? Ooh, you have. Ugh, let me try that again. You've got to know what you're doing to sink one of those pigs. You ought to go have a look. Maybe later, I said. The deputy was standing by the door and made a grunting noise and held up five chubby fingers, which meant the number of minutes I had left before he took my father back to his cell. Is your mom still ticked off at me? Dad asked. What do you think? I tried to explain it to her, but she wouldn't listen. Well, maybe you can explain it to me, I said. I'm old enough to understand. Dad smiled. I believe you are, Noah. My father was born and raised here in Florida, so he grew up on the water. His dad, my grandpa Bobby, ran a charter boat out of Hallover Arena on Miami Beach. Grandpa Bobby passed away when I was little, so I honestly don't remember him. We'd heard different stories about what happened. 
One was that his appendix burst. Another was that he got hurt real bad in a bar fight. All we knew for sure is that he took his fishing boat down to South America on some sort of job, and he never came back. One day, a man from the U.S. Department showed up at my house and told my parents that Grandpa Bobby was dead and buried somewhere in a village in Colombia. For some weird reason, they wouldn't bring his body home for a funeral. I knew this because I'd seen the paperwork. Dad kept a file. At least four or five times a year, he would walk to Washington, D.C., asking someone to help get his father's coffin back to Florida. This is like 10 years later. Mom worked with Dad on the letter. She's a legal secretary, so she gets straight to the point. Mom and Dad first met while they were standing in line to pay speeding tickets at Dade County Courthouse, and they got married six weeks later. I know this for a fact because Mom put the speeding tickets in a scrapbook along with their wedding pictures and stuff like that. The ticket my mother got was for driving 45 miles an hour in a 35 mile hour per hour zone. My dad's ticket was much worse. He was doing 93 on the turnpike. In the album, Dad's ticket looks sort of lumpy and wrinkled because he crumpled it into a ball when the state trooper handed it to him. My mother had used the laundry iron to flatten it out before pasting it next to hers in the scrapbook. About a year after they got married, my parents moved down to the Keys. I'm sure it was Dad's idea because he'd been coming here ever since he was a kid and he hated the big city. I was actually born in 1998 in Char Charlotte Caprice on the U.S. Highway 1. My dad was racing up the 18-mile stretch from Key Largo to the mainland. He was trying to get my mother to the hospital in Homestead. She was lying in the back seat of the car where I was born. Mom did it all by herself. She didn't tell Dad to pull over and stop because she didn't want him interfering. They still argue about this. She says he's got a tendency to get overexcited, which is the understatement of the century. He didn't realize I was born until they got to Florida and I started bawling. Abby came along three years later. Dad talked my mom into naming her after one of his favorite writers, some weird old bird who's buried out west in the middle of the desert. Most of my friends aren't crazy about their sisters, but Abby's all right. Maybe it's not so cool to say so, but the truth is, it's the truth. She's funny and tough and not nearly as irritating as most girls at school. Over the years, Abby and I have developed a pretty good system. She keeps an eye on mom, and I keep an eye on dad. Sometimes, though, I need extra help. So what's the deal, Abby asked as I got back from the jail. We were sitting at the kitchen table. For lunch, mom had fixed us the usual hamburger and cheese sandwiches. Excuse me, ham and cheese sandwiches. He says he got carried away, I said. Abby raised her eyebrow and snorted, not nah, duh. Mom set two glasses of milk on the table. Noah, why does he insist on staying in jail? It's Father's Day, for Pete's sake. I guess he's trying to make a point. All he's making, my sister said, is a jackass of himself. Hush, Abby, Mom told her. He said it's okay to call a lawyer, I nodded. He's not pleading guilty, Abby asked. How can he not plead guilty? He did it, didn't he? It's still smart to have an attorney, said my mother. She seemed calmer now. When the police... Police had first called. She'd gotten real mad and said some pretty harsh things about Dad. Honestly, I couldn't blame her. Even for him, this was a major screw-up. Noah, how are you doing, she asked. I knew she was worried about the jailhouse visit had shaken me up, and I told her I was fine. She said, I'm sure it wasn't easy seeing your father behind bars. They brought him to a private room, I said. He wasn't even wearing handcuffs. My mother frowned slightly. Still, it's not a happy picture. Abby said, maybe he ought to plead insanity. My mother ignored her. Your father has many good qualities, she said, but he's not the most stable role model for a young man like yourself. He'd be the first to admit it, Noah. Whenever I get this speech, I listen patiently and don't say a word. She won't come right out and say it, but mom worries I'm too much like dad. Drink your milk, she said, and then she went in the den to call our lawyer, a named, man named Mr. Shine. As soon as we were alone, Abby reached over and twisted a hair on my arm. Tell me everything. Not now, I jerked my head away to the doorway. Not with Mom around. Abby said, it's all right, she's on the phone. I shook my head firmly and took a bite of my sandwich. Noah, 
or you're holding out on me. Finish your lunch, I said. Then we'll go for a ride. The Coral Queen. I had gone down the stern in 12 feet of water. Her hull, the Coral Queen had gone down stern first in 12 feet of water. Her hull had settled on the marley bottom at the slight angle with the bow aiming upward. She was on one side too. Even at high tide, the top two decks were above the waterline. It was a big, ugly apartment building that had fallen out of the so sky and landed in a basin. Abby hopped off my handlebars and walked over to the water's edge. She planted her hands on her hips and stared at the crime scene. Whoa, he really did it this time. It's bad, I agreed. The Coral Queen was one of those gambling boats where passengers line up and play blackjack, electronic poker, and stuff their faces at the all-you-can-eat buffet. It didn't sound like a ton of fun to me, but the Coral Queen was packed with rafters, was packed to the rafters every night. This was one major difference between Dusty Merle's, Merlin's operation and the gambling cruises up in Miami. The Coral Queen didn't actually go anywhere. That's the reason it was so popular. By Florida law, gambling boats were supposed to travel at least three miles offshore beyond the state boundaries before anyone was allowed to start vetting. Rough weather is real bad for business because lots of customers get seasick. And as soon as they start throwing up, they quit spending money. According to my father, Dusty Muleman's dream was to open a gambling boat that would never let the common safety of its harbor. That way, the passengers would never get queasy to the party. One, only Indian tribes were allowed to run a casino operations in Florida. So Dusty somehow persuaded a couple of those rich Mokosokis from Miami to buy the marina and make it part of the reservation. Dad said the government raised a stink but later backed off because the Indians had better lawyers. Anyway, Dusty got his gambling boat and he got rich. My dad had waited until three in the morning when the last of the crew was gone to sneak aboard. He had untied the ropes, started one of the engines, and idled it out to the mouth of the basin where he'd opened the sea cocks and cut out the hoses, disconnected the bridge pipe, and then dived overboard. The Coral Queen had gone down crosswise in the channel, which meant no other vessels could get in and out of the basin. In other words, Dusty Muleman couldn't, wasn't the only captain in town who wanted to strangle my dad on Father's Day. I locked my bike onto the buttonwood tree and walked down to the charter docks. Abby was trailing behind. Two small skiffs and a Coast Guard inflatable were nosing around the Coral Queen. We could hear the men in their skiffs talking about what had to be done to float the boat, and it was a major project. He's lost his marbles, Abby muttered. Who, Dad? No way. Then why did he do it? Because Don Dusty Muleman had been dumping his holding tank into the water, he said. Yuck. From the toilets? Yep. In the middle of the night when nobody's around. That's gross. And totally illegal, I said. He does it to save money. According to my father, Dusty Muleman was such a pathetic cheapstake that he wouldn't pay to have the Coral Queen salvage hauled away. Instead, his crew had standing orders to flush the waste into the basin, which was already murky. The tide later carried most of the filth out to the open water. Why didn't Dad just call the Coast Guard? My sister asked, wouldn't they, that have been the grown-up thing to do? He told me he tried. He tried, he called everybody he could think of, but none of them could ever catch Dusty in the act, said Dad. He thinks somebody was tipping him off. Oh, please, said Abby. Now she was starting to annoy me. When the wind and current are right, the poop from the gambling boat flo floats out of the basin down the shoreline straight into Thunder Beach. Abby made a pukey noise. Ugh. So that's why they close the park sometimes. You know how many kids go s swimming down there? What Dusty's doing can make you real sick at both ends. Hospital sick, Dad says. So it's not only disgusting, but it's dangerous. Yeah, but I didn't say it was right, Abby, what Dad did. I'm only telling you why. Father hadn't even tried to get away. After swimming back to the dock, he'd sat down in a folding chair, opened a can of root beer, and watched the Coral Reef Coral Queen go down. 
He sat there till dawn, sleeping once when the police arrived. So what now? Abby asked. A dark bluish slick surrounded the Coast Guard. And the men of the Coast Guard inflatable were laying out yellow floating bumpers. It was to keep the oil and the grease from spreading. By sinking the Coral Queen, my father managed himself to make quite a mess. I said, Dad asked me to help him. Abby made a face. Help him what? Break out of jail? Get serious. Then what, Noah? Tell me. I knew she wasn't going to like it. He wants me to help him nail Dusty Muleman, I said. A long silence followed, so he, I figured Abby was thinking up something snarky to say. It turned out she wasn't. I didn't give Dad an answer yet, I said. I already know your answer, my sister said. His heart's in the right place, Abby. It really is. It's not his heart I'm worried about. It's his brain. You better be careful, Noah. Are you going to tell Mom? I haven't decided. She gave me a sideways look, which told me she probably wouldn't. Like I said, my sister's all right. And that wraps up chapter one. Brings us to chapter two. If you want to see what happens... And if he's able to nail Dusty Muleman, you'll need to come by the library and check out the book. I hope you enjoyed this episode, Wondering Wednesdays with, with Mrs. Walker. I can't wait to see you guys back at school. Join me here next week for another episode. Hasta luego.